Hello there, welcome back. So today I have an interesting short story for you. And uh, if you're enjoying my content, please like it, share it, make a comment. I really appreciate that. It helps me out with the algorithms. So thank you for joining me again or for the first time. And if you're here for the first time, please subscribe. Uh, so we're going to start out with, this is The Library of Babel by Jorge Louis Borges, 1941. And here it says, by this art, you may contemplate the variations of the 23 letters, which I think is a very interesting statement. So this is a short story, and I will start now. Thank you again for joining me. The universe, which others call the library, is composed of an indefinite and perhaps infinite number of hexagonal galleries with vast air shafts between, surrounded by very low railings. From any of the hexagons one can see interminably the upper and lower floors the distribution of the galleries is invariable. 20 shelves, five long shelves per side, cover all the sides except two. Their height, which is the distance from floor to ceiling, scarcely exceeds that of a normal bookcase. One of the free sides leads to a narrow hallway, which opens into another gallery, identical to the first and to all the rest. To the left and right of the hallway, there are two very small closets. In the first, one may sleep standing up. In the other, satisfy one's fecal necessities. Also, through here passes a spiral stairway, which sinks abysmally and soars upwards to remote distances. In the hallway, there is a mirror which faithfully duplicates all appearances. Men usually infer from this mirror that the library is not infinite. If it were, why this illusory duplication? I prefer to dream that its polished surfaces represent and promise the infinite. Light is provided by some spherical fruit which bears the name of lamps. There are two transversely placed in each hexagon. The light they admit is in, emit is insufficient, incessant. Like all men of the library, I have traveled in my youth. I have wandered in search of a book, perhaps the catalog of catalogs. Now that my eyes can hardly decipher what I write, I am preparing to die just a few leagues from the hexagon in which I was born. Once I am dead, there will be no lack of pious hands to throw me over the railing. My grave will be the fathomless air. My body will sink endlessly and decay and dissolve in the wind generated by the fall, which is infinite. I say that the library is unending. The idealists argue that the hexagonal rooms are a necessary form of absolute space, or at least of our intuition of space. They reason that a triangular or pentagonal room is inconceivable. The mystics claim that their ecstasy reveals to them a circular chamber containing a great circular book whose spine is continuous and which follows the complete circle of the walls. But their testimony is suspect, their words obscure. This cyclical book is God. Let it suffice now for me to repeat the classic dictum. The library is a sphere whose exact center is any one of its hexagons and whose circumference is inaccessible. There are five shelves for each of the hexagon's walls. Each shelf contains 35 books of uniform format. Each book is of 410 pages, each page of 40 lines, each line of some 80 letters, which are black in color. 
There are also letters on the spine of each book. These letters do not indicate or prefigure what the pages will say. I know that this incoherence at one time seemed mysterious. Before summarizing the solution, whose discovery, in spite of its tragic projections, is perhaps the capital fact in history, I wish to recall a few axioms. First, the library exists ab eterno. This truth, whose immediate corollary is the future eternity of the world, cannot be placed in doubt by any reasonable mind. Man, the imperfect librarian, may be the product of chance or of malevol malevolent demiurgy. The universe, with its elegant endowment of shelves, of en enigmatical volumes, of inexhaustible stairways, for the traveler and latrines for the seated librarian, can only be the work of a god. To perceive the distance between the divine and the human, it is enough to compare these crude wavering symbols which my fallible hand scrawls on the cover of a book with the organic letters inside, punctual, delicate, perfectly black, admittably symmetrical. Second, the orthographical symbols and 25 in, are 25 in number. This finding made it possible 300 years ago to formulate a general theory of the library and solve satisfactorily the problem which no conjecture had deciphered. The formless and chaotic nature of almost all the books, one which my father saw in a hexagon on circuit 1594 was made up of the letters MCV, perversely repeated from the first line to the last. Another, very much consulted in this area, is a mere labyrinth of letters. But the next to last page says, O oh, time thy pyramids. This much is already known. For every sensible line of straightforward statement, there are leagues of senseless cacophonies, verbal jumbles and incoherences. I know of an uncouth region whose librarians repudiate the vain and superstitious custom of finding a meaning in books and equate it with that of finding a meaning in dreams or in the chaotic lines of one's palm. They admit that the inventors of this writing imitated the 25 natural symbols, but maintain that this application is accidental and that the books signify nothing in themselves. This dictum, we shall see, is not entirely fallacious. For a long time it was believed that these impenetrable books corresponded to the past or remote languages. It is true that the most ancient men, the first librarians, used a language quite different from the one we now speak. It is true that a few miles to the right the tongue is dialectical, and that ninety floors farther up it is incomprehensible. All this, I repeat, is true but 410 pages of inalterable MCVs cannot correspond to any language, no matter how dialectical or rudimentary it may be. Some insulated that insinuated that each letter could influence the following one, and that the value of MCV in the third line of page 71 was not the one the same series may have in another position on another page. But this vague thesis did not prevail. Others thought of cryptographs. Generally, this conjecture has been accepted, though not in the sense in which it was formulated by its originators. 500 years ago, the chief of an upper hexagon came upon a book as confusing as the others but which had nearly two pages of homogeneous lines. He showed his find to a wandering decoder who told him the lines were written in Portuguese. Others said they were Yiddish. 
Within a century, the language was established. Samoyedic Lithuanian dialect of Guarani, with classical Arabian inflections. The content was also deciphered. Some notions of combinative analysis illustrated with examples of variations with unlimited repetition. These examples made it possible for a librarian of genius to discover the fundamental law of the library. This thinker observed that all the books, no matter how diverse they might be, are made up of the same elements, the space, the period, the comma, the 22 letters of the alphabet. He also alleged a fact which travelers have confirmed. In the vast library, there are no two identical books. From these two incontrovertible premises, he deduced that the library is total and that its shelves register all the possible combinations of the 20 odd orthographical symbols. A number which, though extremely vast, is not infinite. Everything, the minutely detailed history of the future, the archangels, autobiographies, the faithful catalogues of the library, thousands and thousands of false catalogues. The demonstration of the fallacy of those catalogues, the demonstration of the fallacy of the true catalog, the Gnostic gospel of Basilitis, the commentary on that gospel, the commentary on the commentary on that gospel, the true story of your death, the translation of every book in all languages the interpolations of every book in all books. When it was proclaimed that the library contained all books, the first impression was one of extravagant happiness. All men felt themselves to be the masters of an intact and secret treasure. There was no personal or world problem whose eloquent solution did not exist in some hexagon. The universe was justified the universe suddenly usurped an unlimited dimensions of hope. At that time, a great deal was said about the vindications, books of apology and prophecy, which vindicated for all time the acts of every man in the universe and retained prodigious arcana for his future. Thousands of the greedy abandoned their sweet native hexagons and rushed up the stairways urged on by the vain intention of finding their vindication. These pilgrims disputed the narrow corridors, proffered dark curses, strangled each other on the divine stairways, flung their deceptive books into the air shafts, met their death cast down in a similar fashion by the inhabitants of remote regions. Others went mad. The vindications exist. I have seen two which refer to persons of the future, to persons who are perhaps not imaginary. But the searchers did not remember that the possibility of a man's finding his vindication, or some treacherous variation thereof, can be computed as zero. At that time, it was also hoped that a clarification of humanity's basic mysteries the origin of the library and of time might be found. It is very similar that these grave mysteries could be explained in words. If the language of philosophers is not sufficient, the multiform library will have produced the unprecedented language required with its vocabularies and grammars. For four centuries now, men have exhausted the hexagons. There are official searchers, inquisitors. I have seen them in the performance of their function. They always arrive extremely tired from their journeys. They speak of a broken stairway, which almost killed them. They talk with the librarian of the galleries and stairs. Sometimes they pick up the nearest volume and leaf through it, looking for infamous words. Obviously, no one expects to discover anything. As was natural, this inordinate hope 
was followed by an excessive depression, a certitude that some shelf in some hexagon held precious books, and that these precious books were inaccessible, seemed almost intolerable. A blasph blasphemous sect suggested that the searches should cease and that all men should juggle letters and symbols until they constructed, by an improbable gift of chance, these canonical books. The authorities were obliged to issue severe orders. The sect disappeared, but in my childhood I have seen old men who for long periods of time would hide in the latrines and some metal discs in a forbidden dice cup and feebly mimic the divine disorder. Others inversely believed that it was fundamental to eliminate useless works. They invaded the hexagons, showed credentials which were not always false, leafed through a volume with displeasure and condemned whole shelves. Their hygienic aesthetic furor caused the senseless perdition of millions of books. Their names, their name is execrated, but those who deplore the treasures destroyed by this frenzy neglect two noble facts. One, the library is so enormous that any reduction of human origin is infinitesimal. The other, every copy is unique, irreplaceable, but since the library is total, there are always several hundred thousand imperfect facsimiles. Works which differ only in a letter or a comma. Counter to general opinion, I venture to suppose that the consequences of the purifier's depredations have been exaggerated by the horror these fanatics produced. <clears throat> they were urged on by the delirium of trying to reach the books in the crimson hexagon books whose format is smaller than usual, all-powerful, illustrated, and magical. We also know of another superstition of that time, that of the man of the book. On some shelf, in some hexagon, men reasoned, there must exist a book that is the formula and perfect compendium of all the rest. Some librarian has gone through it, and he is analogous to God. In the language of this zone, vestiges of this remote functionality, functionaries, cult, still persist. Many wandered in search of him. For a century, they have exhausted in vain the most varied areas. How could one locate the venerated and secret hexagon which housed him? Someone proposed a regressive method to locate book A, consult first book B, which indicates A's position. To locate book B, consult first a book C, and so on to infinity. An adventure such as these, I have squandered and wasted my years. It does not seem unlikely to me that there is a total book on some shelf of the universe I pray to the unknown gods that a man, just one, even though it were thousands of years ago, may have examined and read it. If honor and wisdom and happiness are not for me, let them be for others. Let heaven exist, though my place be in hell. Let me be outraged and annihilated, but for one instance, in one being, let your enormous library be justified. The impious maintain that nonsense is normal in the library and that the reasonable and even humble and pure coherence is an almost miraculous exception. They speak, I know, of the feverish library whose chance volumes are constantly in danger of changing into others and affirm negate and confuse everything like a delirious divinity. Those words, which not only denounce the disorder but exemplify it as well, notoriously prove their author's abominable taste and desperate ignorance. In truth, 
The library includes all verbal structures, all variations permitted by the 25 orthographical symbols, but not a single example of absolute nonsense. It is useless to observe that the best volume of the many hexagons under my administration is entitled The Combed Thunderclap, and another The Plaster Cramp, and another Axaxas Malo. These phrases, at first glance incoherent, can no doubt be justified in a cryptographical or allegorical manner. Such a justification is verbal and ex hypothesi already figures in the library. I cannot combine some characters, which the divine library has not foreseen and which in one of its secret tongues do not contain a terrible meaning. No one can articulate a syllable which is not filled with tenderness and fear, which is not, in one of these languages, the powerful name of God. To speak is to fall into tautology. This wordy and useless epistle already exists in one of the thirty volumes of the five shelves of one of the innumerable hexagons and its refutation as well. And in number of possible languages use the same vocabulary in some of them, the symbol Library allows the correct definition, a ubiquitous and lasting system of hexagon hexagonal galleries. But library is bread or pyramid or anything else, and these seven words which define it have another value. You who read me, are you sure of understanding my language? The methodical task of writing distracts me from the present state of men. The certitude that everything has been written negates us or turns us into phantoms. I know of districts in which the young men prostrate themselves before books and kiss their pages in a barbarous manner. But they do not know how to decipher a single letter. Epidemics, heretical conflicts, peregrinations, which inevitably generate into banditry, have decimated the pop population. I believe I have mentioned suicides more and more frequent with the years. Perhaps my old age and fearfulness deceive me, but I suspect the human species, the unique species, is about to be extinguished. But the library will endure, illuminated, solitary, infinite, perfectly motionless, equipped with precious volumes, useless, incorruptible, secret. I have just written the word infinite, but I have not interpolated this adjective out of rhetorical habit. I say that it is not illogical to think that the world is infinite. Those who judge it to be limited postulate that in remote places, the corridors and stairways and hexagons can conceivably come to an end, which is absurd. Those who imagine it to be without limit forget that the possible number of books does have such a limit. I venture to suggest the solution to the ancient problem. The library is unlimited and cyclical. If an eternal traveler were to cross it in any direction after centuries, he would see that the same volumes were repeated in the same disorder, which thus repeated would be an order, the order. My solitude is gladdened by this elegant hope. Thank you for joining me.